That was really loud, I'm sorry. <laughs>
So that's more narrative. But then the last commercial I did, I was an animated car for a gas company where I was like, oh, she used to be in a baby seat, now she's in the driver's seat. And it was, so it was, it was still like doing a character. So even though it was for something else, and, that, and I tend to get cast in a lot of that kind of stuff even when I'm doing commercial work. So I say, you know, the big difference is you don't, you won't, no one is seeing you. You screw it up, you can do it again. Um, you don't have to worry about, oh, my face is broken out, or you don't like my costume, or, or anything, and what's my line? That's the biggest difference. What about you? Um, you also don't have, well, depending on what thing you're doing, like if you're doing a video game or whatever, you're by yourself, so you don't have fellow actors to work off of, so that um, is, it brings a whole new level to it. Um, but, you know, yeah, like she said, it's, it's acting. First and foremost, for sure. I think also that you could be bigger because if you're getting on camera, it's going to look weird if you're too big. You'll freak people out. But if you're just doing your voice super big, you can do anything with your body, anything with your face. And we do that when we're recording. We'll just get as ridiculous as possible, and it brings out a good sound. So there's actually, I think it's a little more fun not to be seen. Well, and I'd rather do a death scene on the mic than a death scene in person, right? If you have to do something over and over again, then like, you know, like flinging yourself down on the ground or like doing combat where you were likely to get hurt as opposed to just like standing by yourself and be like, ah, by yourself. So how many actors are in the audience right here? Yes? Nice? All right, cool. It's good to know. Yeah. So I wanted to follow that up with, you mentioned while well, you're doing voice acting, you're making faces, you're doing big extravagant motions. What does it take to get into character for some of those things? Because if you're trying to visualize what it is your character is doing, what do you have to do mentally to get your voice ready for that line? What a great question. I think, it, I think to some degree it depends on if how, I mean, to get your voice ready, like if you're doing a different character, someone who sounds really different, but I feel like so many video games, like especially any kind of like a, you know, you think about or like those war ones, the Call of Duty or whatever, a lot of people sound like they sound. So it's about, you know, thinking of the stress of the situation or like, like trying to remember the, the circumstances of the situation the character is in. If you're, if you're doing a much different voice than yourself, I mean, obviously things like warming up, I think you were talking about um, your, steamer. your steamer. Colleen told me about the steamer. I'm so excited I got a steamer. Well, it helps because I, you know, your, your voice gets worn out and you can drink all the water in the world, but it, it takes longer to get to your vocal cords. Like, yes, you should stay hydrated, but um, if you have a steamer, it goes right, right to your cords, which are, you know, need to stay lubricated. If you don't have a steamer, you can just use the dishwasher, just open it up and go. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, in your hotel room, you just get a, a really hot washcloth. Sometimes, um, if I sing, for sure. Um, but as far as like, um, like we talked about this too, like physicality is a big, it's a big thing. Um, you can, you know, if you know that your your character is maybe more uptight, maybe you're going to stand straighter and more precise. Or if they're like, uh, and then you're going to be more like this, you know. I have to stand up. I can't sit and do voiceover. Like I have to be. I have to have it in my body. All the things so I can't wear loud clothes. <laughs> I was just recording a dubbing job, and there was like I was in this pretty big studio space, and there was like a couch behind me. And um, someone, the director, was asking the engineer, he's like, "Does anyone ever sit on the couch?" And he said, "There was actually something they did recently where the character was supposed to be super lazy, and he just kept sounding too alert when he was sitting up. So they had him lay on the couch, and they just put mics over him, and he like delivered all his lines like supine." Um, and they said that that actually really helped with the sound. And, I'm, and then, you know, have you ever seen the bars that people use for efforts? They have these, it looks like almost like a hitching pose thing, which, yeah, tie a horse to it. But it's, it's so that when you're, if you're getting like punched in this, you can like throw yourself over this thing. It's about waist high. Yeah. I did too. And that's all I ever did. Because I would lean on it, and then they were like, oh, that's for efforts. And I was like, oh, that's so great. Yeah, that's what I, I didn't know that until recently either. Until someone mentioned, I'm like, that's. I wasn't doing any effort, so I didn't think about it. But I was, yeah, I was leaning on it. <laughs> and you know, the other thing too that kind of came to my mind is when we're in a recording studio, a lot of times we're in a booth, and so there's not a lot of visual stimulation. 
Um, and uh, so you know this from when you play the games, that you can imagine the character and you almost feel like you are the character. And that's how we feel when we're doing these voices, is we're imagining, you know, what does Peach look like? Uh, you know, what does Tails look like? What does, what does Toad look like? Or Toadette? And, and we're, we're feeling like we are that person in that minute as the, as the voice is coming out. And uh, it's a blast. It's really fun. But it is like when I play the games, like when I was racing Mario Kart, and I would make the same sounds as I made in the studio, and it's like, same, same. So pretty much probably all of you guys could go in a studio and probably make sounds that would be super legit. That's fantastic. So I would like to know, how did all of you begin your careers as voice actors? You guys all already heard my I started, like, it was super organic for me because I was a really shy kid, so I never would have even thought that I could do it. I didn't talk very much until seventh grade, and I found acting helped me because you, you had a script, and so all the social interactions were already squared away. And then I ended up doing radio, which was great because nobody's looking at you, which I really like. And then somebody said, do you have an agent? I think I was doing some national stuff or some kind of serious radio show or something and um, then I just started doing commercials and then my agent I got an agent and um, she said you know go do this audition which I didn't know I had never played any Mario games my friends had kids who played them but I, I had never played them and I did the audition and my voice was a match and then I got home and I was like well I should check out these games <laughs> and I was like oh my gosh what because if I would have known how big it was it probably would have super freaked me out so that I didn't know. Uh, I was just a theater actor, and, and I, uh, you know, it was such an evolution, like Sam talked about, where I was like, oh, it's a theater actor, and then all of a sudden I had, like, on-camera agents for, like, doing commercial and film-type stuff, and then she would submit me for voiceover stuff, because I lived in Portland until recently, and Portland's market is very different than L.A., where, like, L.A., you have a specific voice agent, you have a specific commercial agent, you have a specific TV film theatrical agent, where they're one person a lot of covers everything. So she submitted me for a voiceover job and I booked it and I remember it was like, it's boring, like I mean, the most unsexy thing. I was doing like a training for the Kroger deli department or something. <laughs> like that's seriously what it was. And I remember, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost like more role play type where they would say, I was pretending to be a customer and I said something and I remember the one line was, that chicken looks good. And I remember the director came on and goes, could you make your voice sound less caressy? And I'm like, oh, like I'm trying to sound sexy. I'm like, yeah, that chicken looks good. Um, then I got super self-conscious. I was like, I said, like, that, that chicken looks good. Um, but yeah, so I started doing that. And then it was like later that I started booking the more fun stuff, like, you know, but in Portland, there was much less animation video game type stuff. It's just like far less than if you're in a place like, like LA, did you kind of right out of the gate do animation? I wanted to. I told them that's what I wanted to do. And they said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> um, but I, the, I already, well, you guys already know. I, the first thing I did was a uh, reporter Barbie book. And then it was, um, I did Kids from Room 402 and Digimon from was right on the heels of that. And then it was one of those like weird, like, you know, things come in threes or whatever. And then I did a McDonald's commercial. And then I was like, why don't I want to do commercials? Of course I should do commercials. Um, when you got that check, you were like, I'm going to do commercials. <laughs> yes. So um, so now, like, you know, I, I was a fool. I didn't know. Um, but I mean, I did the, the demo, and I did, I did the things they told me to do. I didn't like it, but I did it. Um, but, I, you know, so no, I didn't just, here I am. Where do I sign up for the animation stuff? No, I mean, it took a while. But yeah, it, it seems to be a little harder to break into that. But... I mean, it, it's, I feel like this is the long game, right? Like, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Like, if you want to do this, it's about just being, like, just really persevering. Like, I have told this story before, but, like, for Genshin Impact, I got that audition because I emailed the director of that project for a year. I'd taken a class from him. Um, I really wanted to work with him. Like, I didn't really care what it was on. I just liked him so much from the class. He was so fun, such a good director. So I just, for a year, kind of would be, like, every two months, like, hey, I took your class. If you ever have an audition, you think I'm right for it. I'd love to audition. And then he ended up sending me that. And I ended up booking it. But I didn't know what it was at all at the time. Like, in fact, so many games now, you don't know what you're auditioning for. They send you something, and they give you a reference, but it's not in the name of the project. Just know we're there. Like, 
technology changed the game. People are very secretive about stuff now. So sometimes you're like. Being willing to do things for free, you know, yeah. when you're just starting out, because why not? People have all these cool content things on YouTube and stuff that, and if you have some partners and friends who do things, why not collaborate and just make beautiful things? And you can send it fun. to potential agents. Like, you can be like, here's a clip of my work on YouTube. Right. Like, that's right. Posted, that's really helpful for people. Like, oh, they're, they're talented as opposed to be like, I can do voices. And then they're kind of like, well, prove it. Why should we believe that? And do you find too, guys, like I knew Colleen was talking earlier, she's like doing some awesome things on social media where I'm like, I have no clue, but it, I think that as you have more followers and more people looking at your stuff, that it actually makes a difference for even casting or like attention. Um, so I got strong armed on uh, social media because they, <laughs> I really didn't want to do it. <laughs> really didn't want to do it. Um, but they were, they were, and I don't, I don't know if it's as, Prevalent, maybe it is, and I just whatever it doesn't matter. At the time, they were like, if you don't do Twitter and Instagram and all of the things, and you don't get X, and for whatever reason, like the number was like twenty-five thousand followers or some nebulous number, which I was like, who picked that number and why and what difference does it make? Um, they were casting people like there was a person at they're like, no, seriously, there's a new department at every animation house looking at your social media. And they're gonna look and you're like, we love her for this part, but how many followers does she get? What, she doesn't have Twitter? Moving on. And like, like there were lots of YouTubers and influencers that have, have gotten jobs, voiceover jobs, who do not do voiceovers. But they've gotten these jobs because they have a bazillion followers. This is our world, and so I was like, oh, and I even they have a Bob Marion, plays Porky Pig, and a bunch of other things. He got together with a bunch of social media people that knew things about that stuff, and they did a panel at SAC, and I dragged myself there because I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this, but if I want to keep working, I guess I have to, and so I went to the thing, and I was like, oh, what's the hashtag? Why do I have to use that? And now, they, now the kids are like, Mom, you can't use hashtags anymore. But do we do you can't? I I don't know. Is it that's new? Yes, stuff? no, I don't know. The rules change all the time. And there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so much to keep up with. I don't know either. So we all need to Why can't you use no. yeah. it? Yes. How? Ugh. Well, then I'm cringy. Because I use it all the time. I refuse to say L O L. I won't do it. You can't.
so weird. It was like Change. two really long years. It seems like it was just last year, but it was in it. Oh, well, um, anyway, she wrote Princess of Power. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to make she so bad. But they, they uh, cast a young, young girl. I think they're all like 16 or something. Well, not anymore, because it was how many years ago.
you still get paid the same. Like they're not paying you by the minute. So I'm like, that's a sweet way to make a really like like I'm never really too disappointed <laughs> when it's small stuff because you're like, well, all the way to the bank, man. That was an easy. I'm like, what? Well, people slave for three, four days sometimes to make the money that I just made in ten minutes. So um, yeah, that, that doesn't bother me. I don't know about you guys. No, and they usually have a lot of lines. Like, they usually have a lot. But some of the funner things are when they're like, hey, why don't we, you can be little kid number two, and we're going to do your voice as one of the extra characters, you know, depending on what, what game you're doing. Um, and those are fun, too, because you can just do whatever. Like, it's not stuck in your character's voice or whatever. You can mess around with it. And, and then if it makes the game, you're like, yes, I made it. <laughs> so. I, was, I told the story at Pensacon, but I like one time I was recording for a game and it never ended up getting made. It doesn't exist anywhere. But I, I had like two normal characters, and then they're like, "Hey, could you do a couple extras?" And I was like, "Sure." And they go, "The first one is Crackhorn Number Four," and I was like, "Yes, I really want to do that." And like she had hardly any lines, but she was like, "Hey, hey, can you know, you know like it was like just it, it was kind of like a, a Grand Theft Auto style game. So it'd be like at one point the player might end up in a bad place and you would like approach the car and ask for money or something, whatever it was. But yeah, I was thrilled because I was like, I didn't even audition for that, but this is going to be fun. <laughs> Same, I don't, you know, we, lo we love what we do and if I get to go in and do anything, you know, and hit four lines, 400 lines, it's all good. Yeah. Thank you for the commendable attitude. <laughs> Um, so, uh, other than anything, Mario, Fire Emblem, or Sonic, I wanted to know what are your favorite Nintendo games and characters? Could you repeat the question? I didn't quite hear it. So, other than anything like Mario, Some favorite characters other than like Sonic or Mario, like like the main ones. Well, that's some of the other favorite that characters. That we voiced or that we like to play. Yeah. His favorite characters in those franchises that you did, that you voiced, yes. I, I love doing Noel and Genshin Impact. That's just a really fun game. Um, I've had a great time voicing. She talks a lot more than Rosalina, too. Like, Rosalina's just a lot of. Like that kind of stuff, and then Noelle has like things to say, and like like sentences and paragraphs, so that's really fun. And I love the look of that game, I think the artwork in it is very beautiful, so I kind of just love looking at it. Um, I, I've worked on uh, Guild Wars 2 for a really long time, did anybody play Guild Wars? Yeah. Um, and I didn't, you know, most of the time when you work on a game, it does, it's not always ongoing, and that one, I, I think it's probably been 10 years maybe, I don't know, and it just keeps coming back and they keep adding it and it's so beautiful. Like, Orin is just gorgeous. I don't get to play Orin, but I, I'm the, um, the female, uh, Asura, oh, not Asura, that's Asura Sensei. Um, Asura, sorry, Asura, Asura. Um, anyway, I just, it's, the animation is just so beautiful in that game, so that's one of my, I, I love that I get to work on that project, and I don't know how many people play it, but it's, it's just gorgeous, and the dragons are just, oh, stunning. Someone came up and I had forgotten about, like, one of the first games I ever voiced was um, for kids. It was the Backyard Sports series, and it was Sunny Day. I don't know if any was like that. It was, like, way old school. Um, but that one was so fun because my niece and nephew got to play it, and when uh, they saw me, they're like, why does Andy Sam's hair look so different? <laughs> So I don't know, I, I love, I mean, just to, the memories that we have from voicing the games are really special to us too, just based on what was going on in our lives at that time as well. And you were talking specifically about games, right, not other projects? Um, good question. It takes so much courage to ask a question. You did great. Seriously, awesome.
mission, like Transformers, there's always voices that need to in those, and Overwatch has always had characters. Like, any games that, or animation projects y'all have been looking forward to just trying to get yourselves into? You know, we, we audition all the time, and so it's whatever comes up, like, for me at least, I, I love to work, so I'm happy to be in anything. Would we? Would I love to be in a, a big, like, Genshin-type franchise or Demon Slayer or something like that? Absolutely. Um, but for me, it's more about, you know, like, I get really excited for new shows. I don't like what you said. I get really excited for, um, like, if, if an audition comes through and I feel like, oh, I could do that character. I just, well, I, you know, there's certain ones that you're just like, and I'll actually, like, I, I, I got to a point where I had to, I started writing everything down because I, I was desperate. Like, I really wanted to work. I wanted it so, so, so bad. And, but it was, you know, taken over. So I would write them down. If I wrote it down, then I could forget about it. Because you just never know. And it's not personal. And it doesn't, doesn't mean that you didn't do well. It means that they were looking for something else. And that's okay. Or maybe you sounded too much like some other character. Who knows? There's no way to know. Maybe they needed Cousin Fred to do it. I don't know. But there's no rhyme or reason to it. So you, you, it's so hard not to take it personally, but you have to not. So often, though, you need Still, like I'll, I'll, an audition come through, and I'm like, oh my god, I want that so bad, and I just have to just, push. I just have to, you put it out there, and you just hope for the best. And every once in a while, I'll just call my agent and be like, so that thing that I did, like, did, did you hear it? Did, did you know? Did somebody else get it? And I'm like, stop thinking about it. But um, you know, so for me, I just, I just love what I do, and and there are certain characters and things that will speak to me, but I don't necessarily have a franchise that I'm like. You know, like I would love to do something on Star Wars, that would be amazing, I love Star Wars, or a Star Trek something, because I'm a total nerd, but I, it's, for me it's more about like, oh, I can't wait to do that character that I just read because I think I could do that. I think, like, I, I'm really interested in getting into more anime, like anime shows right now, like that's something I've been like, just kind of had my eye on, and really like to kind of find my way into that. Um, I also would love to be on The Simpsons, you know, I've just been a fan of it for so long and I think it's such a creative, funny, well, like any kind of like adult swim cartoons, I just think the writing in those shows is so great, so any of that kind of stuff, I'd be like, yeah, I would do that in a heartbeat, I think that would be really fun to be a part of, but like, yeah, like, uh, <laughs> call me, <laughs> I, I, I was, no, I was going to call you Sam, I was like, that's Did you know each other? That's calling. We have met in the hallway. I know. We, we had dinner last night. I thought it was Sam the whole time. Um, no, but I I do like everything new coming up. As, like That's super exciting to me to be a part of that. And, and there's a project that a friend and I who sometimes coach with each other, we both were up for. And we both were like, oh, we want this project so bad. And neither, we both auditioned. We felt really good about what we did. Neither of us heard anything. And then months went by, and all of a sudden, they were reading from, oh my God, another call to like read. It wasn't a callback, necessarily, but I was suddenly asked to read for again, and I called her, I'm like, it's not dead. Like, we both thought it was over. I'm like, this is still casting, because now I'm like auditioning, and I don't know if it's like a new group of casting coming in, if new producers took over, it's hard to say. But we were both like that, now we're like, both like stalking this project, being like, when is that gonna like be, and are we gonna be a part of it? I think it's a good message for anything in life. It's like, if you feel like it's over, it's not always over. You just keep hope, hope strong. I would like to do more things with action in it, but I'm a little gun shy because, okay, so I work in radio is like my regular job. And um, I had a really bad experience, um, what I did, I created. So I work super early in the morning. Like I get up at three and I do all the, the stuff in it. It's actually on the radio. And I was in the studio and I thought, well, I can just do some auditions while I'm, because it's three in the morning, nobody's here. And, and so I started recording and it was for an action game and it was, this girl was getting killed or something. So it's like, ah, ah, help! I feel like I'm doing all this stuff, right? And I didn't realize that I had the pot up and so it was going out over the air. And people thought that I was being killed. So then my boss calls up and he's like, what are you doing? So that's it. I'm a little like any auditions. I'll only do them at home, like not in the studio, because obviously, because. Still got plenty of time for more Q and A. If anybody else wants to.
asking them, ask them a question, come line up. What's more important is that you do you. 
because they're not always really looking for the next person unless that person is quitting or has passed away or something. So you might be waiting a long time if that's where you put all your energy. Now, there's the exceptions to it, like Eric Belzil, who's like every voice of Looney Tunes. He is Bugs Bunny, he's Elmer Fudd, he's, he's everything. But he's it right now. So they don't need anyone else to do that. So you can like wait till his career is over. Um, you know, which but that's kind of dark. So don't wait for people to die. <laughs> yeah, you go like, oh, I'll make that career over. Um, like, but, but you know what I mean? Like, if someone's like, well, I do a really good Betty Boop, and that's my thing, and it's like, right, but until whoever's currently doing that's gone, it's great to work on your own stuff and to sound like yourself because you really never know what they're looking for. And I think I don't know what you guys think about this, but half the time I don't think they're know what they're looking for till they hear it, and you can see specs on a job that say we want it to sound like this and so you go you do a read according to those specs and then you hear it and you're like that is nothing like what they said they wanted and then you yeah so then you're like so i always say do one according to specs and then do one according to just whatever is interesting to you and you'd be surprised sometimes if you book it and you go in and you go i did two reads which one did you like how often they'll be like that second one because i think if you're thinking of what casting is hearing where they're like listening to audition after audition after audition of everyone trying to sound like the thing they said they wanted to hear and then someone comes in and they suddenly did it with a russian accent out of nowhere um and you know they pitched it like way higher way low and suddenly they went oh my god that's so interesting mainly because they were just bored and it really like i mean maybe the other thing was what they really wanted but then they also know you can do both like if you're like you're going to do a spec and then i'm going to do a wild card then they're like great and we decide we want what we said we wanted she could do that but then isn't that interesting and that's a way we never thought to do it so sometimes i'll like completely ignore the specs and be like i'm just going to do whatever they said American accent, I don't care, I'm gonna do a German one. Because I feel like it. <laughs> and no one else is probably going to do that. And then they might remember it. Uh, adding those sorts of little quirks inside of an audition is kind of your way of proving to the engineer that you can modulate your voice in various different ways to still sound like the character, but give it a spin to match any kind of extraneous dialogue. I think that's a good call. Uh, thank you for answering that question. I have my own little voice acting niche quirk that I've known for. Okay. I'm a professional streamer. You ever heard of Goku and Dragon Ball? Yes. yes. I can bring the lights down in this entire house. Yes. Please don't scream on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I know this question was kind of answered earlier. of Peach and Toad at the time, and I don't remember, or maybe I never fully knew, I think she had, she was sick, or someone or her family had something going on, and she couldn't make it for recording, and so they were like, hey, uh, get, you know, they were, I live in Seattle, so they were going, you know, let's bring some people in, and I came in, and they go, can you do this with your voice? I was like, yeah, so it was a perfect match, or very close, and, and that's how it started for me, but again, it's just willingness to show up and be foolish and do whatever, give it a try. You know, um, and it's worked well. That's been, that was 2007. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I've gotten most of my stuff through my agents. But like I said, with the Genshin thing, that was me just kind of hustling on my own because I wanted to work with that director. I like wasn't specifically going after that thing, but I just knew someone I wanted to work with. But I see pe people like, especially like for anime and things like that. You know, go after like not go after because I don't want to give, to give the idea like you should be really aggressive. I get you arrested. No stalking. Yeah, but, but like if you like contacting people on like Twitter and social media but posting a lot of your stuff so that it's out there and then sometimes tagging people or sending it to people like I'm seeing people do stuff like that and having some level of success in terms of breaking in in that way it's a little bit of a crap shot I'll, I'll tell you that like it's not always and you, you better be pretty good right you know I mean that's the kind of thing like can anyone just do that and get noticed and get a job no but if let's say you're very specific like we want someone with a really like a Filipino accent, and they need to actually be from the Philippines, um, and it needs to be like a high. They can go high to low, and they have to speak um, you know, Chinese. And it's not sometimes I'm shocked at the things people put in specs. I'm like, oh, good luck. And but then there may be someone out there who needs that. So if you're really specific, sometimes that can work in your favor. 
or um, you're very, very good, or you're just exactly what they had in mind, and that's the arbitrary thing Colleen was talking about, but you don't know, like, what it is. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, uh, there was another question can I ask this up here. Um, so, out of all the Nintendo games that you guys worked on, each, what was the most impactful one that you have worked on, and, you know, which one gave you the best experience for you? I liked Odyssey a lot um, because it was such a surprise and it always is a surprise when we go in. We don't get to see the scripts before we go in and um, they make us sign a lot of things like don't talk about this because it's going to take a while for the game to come out and they don't want anyone to know that before it comes out. It's going to be a surprise. So when I went in for Odyssey, I, they had a lot of the, the animation and I was just like, wow, this is beautiful and there's so much story to it and the ending. You know, and I kind of liked it because, I don't know, just the idea that, you know, enough! You know, Peach is like, no, I don't know, whatever, she doesn't know. And, and to me, there's just that, um, that was fun. That was a fun one to imagine and to be a part of. I don't know which ones are on Nintendo. Oh, yeah, specifically about Nintendo, I don't know. Oh, I, for me, it was Super Mario. Mario 3D World because that was the first one I did. Like that was the first one I worked on and it was so exciting to be there and to be working on it and it was this new game like, you know, it wasn't even totally done when I was working on it. They had almost more of a prototype um, and she turned into a cat in that game and that hadn't happened before. And so there was like lots of, lots of stuff around that and, it, and they were really collaborative and fun to work with. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, it was pretty cool. I played both of those games. It was just crazy here. Uh, have you ever felt inspired to dress as your characters? Boy, I was more inspired before I started coming to these and realizing how much I'm going to suck next to everyone and you're like, how people like, jeez, your costume is terrible next to some of the people who cosplayed. I'm intimidated to do it now, but uh, I thought about it. What? I could be great. But, but I mean, have you seen some of the wigs people have crafted together for this where they show up and it's the perfect, I mean, it's impeccable, like what some of these people come up with. And so I'm a little intimidated by cosplay now. I was telling someone this earlier before I did any kind of a con, like my first one was in January of this year. I thought, oh, it'll be kind of like Halloween where you see people with some masks or someone with some cat ears. And then you get here and it's the next level. Like it's so good. And people making these 3D printer pieces of armor and things that light up and sounds and the whole thing. Like it's. It is beyond what I ever thought it was going to be. I was very impressed. Have you guys have you ever cosplayed as Tails or anything? So I was at a convention in the Halloween weekend, and so I just was like, well, I can't do a whole, I didn't have time because I hadn't thought it, um, whatever. And so I, I, <laughs> I got, I just got some fox ears and two little tails and stuck them in the back and forget what I wore the rest of it. But I've always wanted to do Eno, and I'm very not blonde. So, um, you know, then I'm like, ah, oh, I gotta do a wig and the whole thing and where to get the fish nutty things and I don't know. But I've always wanted to try, you know, because I thought that would be fun. But I don't know. Could I rock the, the midriff thing? Maybe I'd do older, you know. Although, you can still see your belly. I don't know! <laughs> <laughs> I think anyone who does cosplay is so brave. Like, it's yes. the most beautiful thing and you make everyone so happy. And it, it just, it makes my heart, that's my favorite thing about cons, in addition to the culture, is to see the awesome cosplay. It just, it makes you smile until your face hurts and you can't stop. And um, I, bought, I did buy a peach wig and crown and dress, and I tried it on at home in my room and I went, no. <laughs> I'm not going to ruin it for everyone. But um, not because people wouldn't be kind, they would, but it's just a personal thing. I'm like, no. Peach needs to be in her 20s. I think it's a better idea. <laughs> like, I'll tell you what, I would do it if, you, like, like you, me, and Kenny, wherever, like, I went okay. together, and you both agreed to do it. Okay. I would do it, but I wouldn't do it by myself. Okay. All right. If we do this, you are gonna post. Do you think on. Kenny would do it? He'd do best. Yeah, he'll do it. He'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, then you have to do tails. Like we're over at 
we're together. Like if I would be Is that a yes or no? Do you think yes or do you think no? Yes! yes. Okay. And then they got to get us like some little cars and we could then race in costumes. Yes. And I would do something, I would do an event. Yeah, right? See, the creativity is already flowing. I love it. You're so fantastic. <laughs> Actually, I got one. If, uh, if anybody else still wants to line up, but I have one. Um, and actually, first of all, I'm Jamie. Great to meet you. Uh, I asked Colleen this question not too long ago, so I wanted to ask the two of you the same thing. So, time machine. Back to your childhood. It's Saturday morning. What are your favorite cartoons to watch? And what is your Saturday morning ritual like? Do you have cereal? Do you, does your mom eat pancakes? Like, what, what, what does that look like? That's such a great question. No one has ever asked that, but that's a great question. I mean, for me, it was, my sister was an early riser, like I always was a more later sleeper, but she was up before anyone was up, and she was watching TV. She'd have her blanket spread out with all her stuffed animals, and she'd be like watching TV, and then I would come down at some point before our parents were up, and we would usually watch, I remember like, Josie and the Pussycats, and the Super Friends, um, trying to think of other stuff liked. Scooby Doo, Scooby Doo, uh, Looney Tunes, like, yeah, like that was, and, um, and then yes, my mother always made like hot breakfast on weekends, like it was cereal during the week, which a lot of times was tied into cartoons and we would beg for a cereal that we would eat two bowls out of, dig out the prize, and then it would go stale. And we had a boneyard of like abandoned cereal in the pantry and she would be like, I'm never going to have this for you again. We're like, well, we got to collect all the magnets. She goes, you eat like, <laughs> Two holes out of that, and I was like, boom, boom. And then the ones where you got to cut the UPC out of to send to get the special toys for yeah. you. You're doing double one, basically. Yeah. But yeah, she would make like chocolate chip pancakes or French toast or something like that. Like, yeah, like that's waffles. Like, that was always the, our, our weekend breakfast. And of course, then like watching it from the TV from the table while we were trying to eat. Very nice, very nice. What was yours? My, um, well, the cereal part I could talk about. I watched Super Friends. My, my cereal, my parents were like super strict about our diet, and so our cereal, the only two choices we had were Cheerios and unfrosted mini wheats. Just like, Cheerios and unfrosted mini wheats taste like the box. Just eat the box. Like, this is like <laughs> meat. It's just like a mushy, mushy mess. So, yeah, the point of the breakup. I'm still traumatized from that, but I'm, I'm good now. <laughs> I can buy my own cereal, yes! It's like your Saturday, Saturday morning like sugar cereal was yeah. robbed from you. Yeah. Um, I was just remembering something else. Oh, La I remember Laugh Olympics, there was that show? Yes! I remember yes. my sister getting spanked because remember Mudsy on Laugh Olympics? And he'd go, <laughs> he would do that. She was trying to imitate it, but it sounded like she was saying the F word, like when she was doing it. And my parents thought she was cursing, and I remember her like getting punished for imitating Mozi. Oh, that's hilarious! Yeah. As I can think about that, it makes me think about the like the Animal Olympics and all those random cartoons that we grew up on. I was like, that's amazing. Was yeah. like, those are wonderful stories. That's yeah. such a great question. It's so fun.
he, the director uh, Patrick, he, he explained it all to me, and and then he's like, so you're you're this schoolgirl, but then this this crazy person comes and takes over your body. And it's, it's you, but it's not you. I'm like, okay, I get it. But then he's like, but we're gonna do the not you first. And I was like. Okay, well maybe we should establish what the me me sounds like yeah. first, so that I know what not me can you know. So that was a, it was a little bit tricky, but um, but yeah, like you had to just like okay, I'm me taking over me, but and so I have to sound like me, but not. And so it was like a, it was like you know sort of like a little mind game that I had to play with myself. Like oh man, I'm in bad mood right now, so I'm like oh hi, <laughs> but kind of sounded like her anyway, so. Would you say that Kanye is the most stereotypically evil character you've ever played? Um, I mean, I was also Lolly, 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 Lolly. I never know how to say that. Uh, from Bleach, she was pretty. She was pretty bad, baddie, bad girl. Um, and then in um, oh, what was that show called? And I played the really mean girl. I can't remember. But I, I, I played, I played mean. But yeah, probably Kanye was. She was the, she was the nuttiest, like. She was, the, she was a nice person. Thank you. So. I tend to find villains are the most fun to play as. Oh, so much fun. So much fun. Love it. Way more fun. Excellent. Nice. Thank you all so much. Thank you, ladies, for joining us today. I appreciate it. Too, if you have one last chance to get a photo opportunity or an autograph, or just say hi to all of our fellow guests here, come see them right at the front lane.